We've been uh, doing a series that I have no idea how to explain or, or to say, but today what I want to do is talk about John Mark. Um, you know him as the guy who wrote the gospel called Mark. And I um, wanted to give you some background on him because there's probably, you probably know that he wrote a gospel, one of the four, and you probably know a lot about that. And you can maybe even tell us some of the content. Maybe you have a favorite verse or so from there or a story that he told about. I don't know how much you know about his background. For instance, his mother's name was Mary, and uh, that really helps because there's like six or seven Marys in the Bible, and so, you know, it, it's not the one you're thinking of, it's the other one. So um, she's one of those Marys. Um, apparently, the, his mother Mary, and we don't know anything about his father, but they or she, had some level of success, some level of um, wealth, um, and certainly a strong relationship with some of the apostles of Jesus because we see her hosting things. For instance, in Acts chapter 12, you might remember the story of when Peter was imprisoned and, and he was going to be put to death most likely the next morning. And in the middle of the night, an angel pops into the uh, cell with him and speaks to Peter and tells him to get up and go and the chains fall off. And Peter says later, he didn't even know if it was a dream or what, but he was following this angel out and they go by the guards and they go by more guards and, and then they come to the, the gate of the city and the gates open up automatically by themselves. I think it had one of those electric eyes on it um, 2,000 years ago. And, it, and they go in and then all of a sudden the angel's gone. And that's when he realized like, well, wait a minute. That was for real. This is really, really happening. And he goes to the house where the disciples and the apostles are, and it happens to be Mary's house, the mother of John Mark. And he knocks on the door, and, um, and he's hoping someone lets him in. And the young servant girl, Rhoda, comes to the door, and it's like, let me in as Peter. You know, they've been after me. I, let me in quickly kind of thing. And she goes back and tells everybody else, and they've been praying. They've been praying earnestly and hard that God would spare Peter's life. We don't want anything to happen to Peter. And they're praying like crazy. And Rhoda says, you won't believe it. Peter's at the door. And they're like, yeah, no, that's not true. It's not possible. Uh, he can't be out. You know, We're praying for him to get out. He can't be free. Uh, really, God can't answer that prayer. But he did. Well, it's John Mark's mom's house is where that was. And I'm going to guess that John Mark was there. They had a relationship. Uh, with the disciples and, and the apostles. By the way, um, John Mark is his name, is how some of us know him. Uh, John was his Jewish name. That's what most of the Jewish people called him. Mark was his Roman name. And so, you know, the Gentiles may have called him that. He had a cousin that was pretty popular too. His cousin's name was Barnabas. And you can read about him in Acts a little bit, starting in chapter 4, really. Barnabas was a great man of God who had a wonderful, godly, loving, generous, gracious spirit. And so that would have been a cousin to John Mark. And we learn as time goes on that John Mark was a very dear friend and possibly even was converted through the ministry of uh, who we know as Peter. Uh, the Apostle Peter, um, they had a lot of conversations together. They spent a lot of time together. And John Mark listened to a lot of sermons by Peter. And probably that might be where he uh, got some of his firsthand knowledge of information about Jesus. We believe that's true because if you read through the Gospel of Mark, you'll find that it follows a pattern that is very, very similar to Acts chapter 10 when Peter is speaking at Cornel to Cornelius, one of the very first Gentile converts. Um, it's a very similar pattern. Um, so we really believe that John Mark wrote a lot of this. Most people almost unanimously agree that John Mark was not there for the life of Jesus. Where did he get his information? He got it from Peter, from private conversations, from hearing sermons, uh, just got a lot of his information from Peter. Justin Martyr, who is a uh, hundred so years later, um, big time godly believer and historian, called the book of um, 
Mark, the Gospel of Mark, called it the memoirs of Peter. That's what he used to call it, the memoirs of Peter. So it's pretty well accepted that um, John Mark got his information and, and his data from Peter. Most of his material was written intentionally for Gentiles, uh, especially those in Rome. And people believe pretty strongly that he most likely was in Italy or somewhere even in Rome uh, when he wrote this. And some of his uh, writing was uh, the way it was because of the persecution that the believers in and around Rome were facing. You've heard about the Colosseum and some of those things that were going on. And so he, John Mark wrote specifically the way he did because he wanted to demonstrate a couple things for those who were being persecuted. They needed to know that Jesus had suffered. They needed to know that he had gone through quite a bit. Here they were, for Jesus' sake, suffering great persecution. It, it kind of helped them to know that, yeah, he walked that path as well. But even more important is they needed to know that he triumphed over his sufferings. He was victorious over the persecution. He rose again, and, and he had great power. And as you read the, the um, Gospel of Mark, you will be, I think, impressed with the fact that you don't get a lot of Jesus dialogues and quotes, but he's just a man of action. It's like Jesus did this, and then immediately he did this, and then immediately he did that. The word immediately comes a lot in, in the Gospel of Mark, and it's like he did this, and then he went and did this, and then immediately this happened, and he's telling us all these things, all the things Jesus did to make him such a great and wonderful Savior. It's not a biography. Uh, it's not uh, a record of everything about Mark or about Jesus, but it's really a record of the actions and the achievements that Jesus had that he thought was profitable for Gentiles who were being persecuted in Rome to know. John Mark uses, this is unusual, he uses the present tense a lot when he's reporting it as if he were an eyewitness seeing these things happen. But some of that's probably because he got that from Peter, who was an eyewitness seeing those things happen. And we call it the gospel according to Mark. Uh, so I threw in here uh, a little bit about the word gospel. And it's, we use the word gospel and, um, and we understand it in its biblical sense of meaning proclaiming the good news, good news, proclaiming it, letting it be known. But I found it interesting in Strong's um, writings that he said this about the word. This Greek word, gospel, was originally used to describe the good news of a military victory that was brought from a messenger back to the commander. You know, he would come back and say, hey, great news, we just defeated the enemy over in this field. And they would come back and tell that. Eventually, as it got used more and more, that word came to mean simply a good message. Anything that was good news was called gospel. But in the New Testament, it was really adopted in and used a lot to mean the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. You know, the story that Jesus came to earth and conquered sin and defeated evil. Uh, that the world was just plagued with. You know, we were uh, living in a, a sinful world, and Jesus came and lived that sinless life and sacrificed himself on the cross. And through his obedience, uh, Christ uh, called the apostles, and they continued to share the good news, and, and the rest of the world was able to hear this great, great message. Mark's goal is not just to inform people, but it's to transform people. That's what he wanted to see happen. For those Gentiles living in and around Rome, he wanted to see their lives impacted and changed because of what Jesus Christ has done. And that is a great message. That's a great intent, a great motivation, um, even today. God does transform lives. He really does. You know people. Probably, hopefully, hopefully all of you could say that was me. 
that was me. My life was transformed. Um, but if not, you can certainly look around and see others here today that their lives have been radically changed. After Peter's death, the gospel message needed to be written down. They needed to be able to verify those truths. Uh, you may know that uh, the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were not the earliest written books of the New Testament. Some of the letters, most people believe that James was the first New Testament book that was penned, and some of the letters of Paul were all written earlier. The reason why is because the, disciples, the apostles were still alive and they still had firsthand stories, but one by one, some of them were going, uh, passing on, and eventually, um, these things had to be written down or they'd be lost for future generations. And most people believe that Mark wrote this sometime between 65 and 70 AD after Peter died, but before Nero started his persecution in Rome. And so it was a very timely writing for him. Uh, we know that he was writing for the, uh, for the Gentiles more than the Jews simply because he, he spends more time in his gospel than any of the others do explaining Jewish customs. And that's because the Jewish people would have known exactly what he said. All they had to do is say the name and they would have known. But he's spending time talking to the Gentiles and saying, this is a custom and here's why they do that. And, and he spent more time doing that. Um, he also uh, translates some of the words that were in Aramaic uh, he translates and explains them in, in the Gospel of Mark because some of the Gentiles would not have understood that. There are locations like the Mount of Olives. He spends more time telling where the Mount of Olives are than anybody else, but that's because he's writing to people in Rome that don't know. They're not Jews. So he had a, a purpose and, and who he is writing to. It all benefits us because I don't know about you, but I don't think I'm Jewish and I don't know where all those things are and I don't know all the words. It's interesting too that if, if he was transcribing some of Peter's sermons, Peter would have been preaching in Aramaic and he's writing in Greek. So uh, even that had to be translated a little bit. John Mark is mentioned 10 times in the New Testament. In the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he's mentioned a grand zero of zero, grand amount of times of zero, no times at all there. Unless you think he's the guy in Mark that ran off when at the arrest of Jesus and they held onto his cloak and uh, it's an unnamed person. Some people think that might have been John Mark. I'm not sure. Eventually, once things started moving, the church started getting established and things were going, um, John Mark joined the Apostle Paul and his cousin Barnabas, and he went with them on the very first missionary journey that they took. And it was exciting. Um, you can read about this in Acts chapter 13. However, there was a lot of difficulty, uh, you know, persecution, and, and some of the suffering that they went through. We don't know exactly why. There's no statement anywhere to tell why this happened, but John Mark left that missionary journey and came back. He, he departed uh, from them. He, he left them. And we do know that the Apostle Paul was extremely disappointed and hurt by his uh, departure. It was not what Paul wanted to see happen. So a few, few years later, a couple years later, when Paul was going to put together his second missionary journey, and he and Barnabas were going to go out again and go to another region and try to reach people for Jesus and start churches, Barnabas said, why don't we take John Mark with us? And Paul said, absolutely no way. That is not going to happen. And the next thing you know, there was a little bit of a debate between the two key leaders of the church at that time, and, um, and they split. They went their separate ways. Paul and Barnabas could not resolve that issue between them. And so Paul uh, got Silas and he went his way and Barnabas said to John Mark, why don't you come with me? And so they went to Cyprus and they did their own work. And what, you know, on the surface really does sound like, oh boy, you know, Paul and Barnabas had a fight over John Mark. This is horrible, this is horrible stuff. 
And I would think if you were a believer in his pew that day, you would have probably thought, oh, man, not good. What is going on here? But, you know, if God is God, of course, and one of the things that demonstrates that he's God is that he's able to take the most horrible things that ever happened to you or to me and bring those things together and somehow can, if all the right stuff, if I align myself right with him, uh, God can bring glory to himself through even the worst things you could ever imagine. And so God did that. He took the uh, dispute between Paul and Barnabas and he created two missionary teams and, and sent them out and it doubled and probably quadrupled their efforts. And, um, and it was great what they were able to accomplish. Later on, I think it's because John Mark really uh, was strong, faithful, kept going. Uh, later on, Paul agrees to, um, to welcome him back and they overcame their difficulties that they had. And I have some scriptures listed. You can look at Colossians 4 and Philemon 24, where um, Paul was in his first imprisonment. And, and we find John Mark being with him uh, on occasion and very encouraging. Later on, at the very end of life for the Apostle Paul, he knew when he wrote 2 Timothy chapter 4, he knew that his death could be just, his execution could be just seconds away. He didn't know when it was going to happen, but he knew that it was coming any minute, any day now. And during his writing of that, he says, um, send, he writes to Timothy, he says, send John Mark to me because he is helpful in my ministry. I, I think that talks about how great John Mark did in come, overcoming whatever it was that he had to overcome. But I think it also talks about what a great man Paul was. He was able to overcome his, his hurts and disappointments. Uh, he was able to overcome his prejudice of this other younger guy and said, here I am at the end of my life. They're about ready to uh, de dehead me. And what I really like to have is for John Mark to come. It'd just be so cool if he would come and be with me and give me encouragement in the end of my life. I like what... Charles Ryrie says about that whole experience, one failure in life does not mean the end of usefulness. I hope that sinks in a little bit with you. That's really, really important. I totally agree with Charles Ryrie. One failure in life does not mean the end of usefulness. If we do the right thing spiritually, we come back to, to Christ and we do what he wants us to do, uh, he can use us powerfully in his program and for his honor and his glory. Now, I'm not going to name names, but you can think of people. Apply that to people you know. Think of people who have experienced tough things and, and went away from Christ, and yet Christ brings them back. And, and uh, it's, it's powerful. It's powerful. If there's nothing else you get out of today, you know, write that down, circle it, do whatever you got to do. Hang on to that phrase because it's so true. Obviously, John Mark was impacted by the message of the gospel, the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. I don't know when he first heard about that. I don't know how he learned about Jesus. I know a little bit about his mom and that she was really connected and involved. I don't know what his age was, but one way or another, somehow he, uh, he came to know Jesus Christ in a very personal and powerful way. I, I think because his mother was prominent, uh, at least after the resurrection, by the way, they also, some people believe that uh, her house where they lived was possibly where the Last Supper might have taken place. At as well. I, that's not provable, but it's possible. Uh, it's certain that at least through his being around and, and knowing uh, the people his mother knows, that he had some influence back and forth on his life. And I don't know, maybe the Acts 12 experience where the angel came and brought Peter back to their house, maybe that really uh, substantiated what was going on in his heart and mind as he drew closer to the Lord. A very key verse in, in Mark's gospel is chapter 10, verse 45. 
It says, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Most commentaries will tell you this is the key verse of those 16 chapters in the Gospel of Mark. It's a key verse because the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, um, had a servant attitude. He came to minister to people, to help people, to be of service to people, and he gave his life to ransom. Remember, a ransom is a payment that's made for someone who's captive to set them free. And that's what he did for so many people, all of us, for sure. John Mark was impressed by that servant attitude of Jesus Christ and his followers and the great sacrifice that Jesus gave for all of us. So he writes this documentary about a very unique individual, the Son of Man who came from heaven not to be served, but to give his life as a ransom payment to set captives free. John Mark was one who experienced disappointment uh, in himself, but was restored. He was an obedient servant who compassionately came alongside hurting people. Jesus was. He was an obedient servant who compassionately came alongside hurting people, whether they were hurting physically, especially hurting spiritually. Mark viewed him as the Son of God. I'm going to try to read a bunch of verses to you, just really rapid. But the very first verse of chapter 1 in the Gospel of Mark starts with this, the beginning of the Gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's who Mark says he was. And this, that phrase right there is actually, um, in their culture, is what they would have considered the title of what we call the Gospel of Mark. So Mark would have said, well, no, it's not called the Gospel of Mark. It's called the beginning of the Gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. A little bit later in that chapter, in verse 11, he says, And a voice came from heaven, um, from the Father God, you are, uh, you are my Son, whom I love, and with you I am well pleased. In chapter 3, verse 11, uh, it says that whenever the evil spirits saw him, saw Jesus, they fell down before him, and, and they cried out, You are the Son of God. In chapter 5, verse 7, by the way, I have these written down for you on your outline, so you don't need to worry about that. It says, he shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Swear to me that you won't torture me. That was a demon uh, recognizing that Jesus was indeed the Son of God, and he didn't want to be judged by him. In Mark chapter 9, verse 7, it says, Then a cloud appeared and enveloped them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my Son, whom I love. Listen to him uh, at that transfiguration. And in Mark chapter 13, verse 32, um, it says, No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Again, saying that he is God's Son. Chapter 14, verse 61 um, says... As soon as I locate, it's in the middle. But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer again. And again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ? Are you the Son of the Blessed One? Then he says, I am. So again, Mark saying that he definitely claimed to be the, uh, the Messiah. And last one, the Son of God. Last one is chapter 15, verse 39, uh, where it says, And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus heard his cry, and saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the Son of God. Mark's theme in that, in that gospel writing is that Jesus Christ is God's Son, the Messiah that was sent to earth. He is the Savior who purchased us and who bought us from our sin and gives us the promise of all eternity as we place our faith in him. I try to, you could probably do a much better job than this, but I try to come up with the things that Mark learned in his life and uh, what does he know and learn about the gospel? What is there that you and I can think about 
I'm, I'm not good at this, but I came up with two things. One was um, that the gospel and the message of Jesus Christ is able to transform anyone, anyone. Um, there's no one that is outside the reach of the potential of God's grace. Anyone can be saved. Anyone can be bought. Anyone can be purchased. That's why some of the great men in the past have said things like, when we get to heaven, there's going to be a couple wonders. One's going to be, I didn't think that guy would ever be here in heaven. <laughs> How did he get in? Well, it was through Jesus. There may be someone you say, wow, I can't believe they're not here. Uh, that would be scary. You know, I saw them every Sunday in church. You mean they didn't have faith and trust and belief and commitment to Jesus Christ? Oh, that's frightening. But um, it can transform anyone. It can. And the other thing was what I tried to make a big deal over earlier, and that is failure is not final when it comes to serving Christ. We can be restored. Anyone can be restored if they do the right stuff following the Lord Jesus Christ. These are some of the great truths, I think, that we learn from him, the lessons that we can learn, that we can look at in our own hearts, and our own lives, and take great comfort because those things just up on the screen really speak to the kind of God that you and I serve. What a great and gracious God who's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance and all be in faith relationship with him. Let's have prayer together. Father, how we thank you this day for the promise and the, and the truth that you have given to us in your word. And even the writings of John Mark, who was a remarkable guy, who had so many opportunities of knowing um, firsthand the apostles, uh, probably on an inner circle like none other, with them meeting in his home and just all the opportunities that he had. Um, but he never saw Jesus, as far as we know, not close up at least. And yet uh, he desired to follow. And, and through his life, we have learned so much of what's important in this world. And we know that we too can be transformed by simple faith, by um, relinquishing ourselves and following Jesus Christ. And we know that even when we do that and, and as we stray, as we all do, um, that you are uh, faithful, that you will forgive us our sins and our trespasses, and that you restore us. Lord, we're so thankful for the great victories that we've seen here of those who have come to know Christ, those who have been restored to Christ. That's just wonderful, the way your spirit works, the way your word works. Lord, we pray that you would help us to have many, many more victories in the days, the years, the decades ahead. God, find us all faithful, serving you until the day you call us home. May that bring glory to Christ in his name. Amen.